My name is James Garrett, and I'm the founder of Brain by Design, and I'm an outlier. Welcome to Outlier on Air with Ever Gonzalez, the show where we interview the founders, disruptors, and mavens of the world. Learn how grit, failure, and success are all a part of the entrepreneurial journey. Hey everybody, welcome to Outlier on Air, the podcast where we interview founders, disruptors, and mavens. As always, I'm your host, Ever Gonzalez. On today's episode, we have James Garrett. He is the founder and CEO of Brain by Design. James, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ever. Great to be here. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you for a few different reasons. Uh, I know you personally. We've, uh, we've hung out a little bit. You are in my mastermind group, um, and uh, we've, we've hosted one of your events uh, in Southern Utah, and and we've had a good time. We we, mm. we we know who you are. We like what you're doing. And I think having you on the show is going to be a great fit for for audience with all the different things that uh, that you've experienced and all the different things that uh, that we can learn from you. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being on. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Now let's let's kind of dive right into it. First of all, where are you calling us from? Um, you're in Texas right now, but but where's home base for you? At this point in your life, home base is in Utah. So um, currently in the Salt Lake area, and we'll be moving up to the Eden Huntsville area within a couple months. Being a somewhat of a serial entrepreneur, and and we'll get into your background here in just a bit. Uh, right now, up there, what's it like being an entrepreneur in that area? Um, do you have a lot of opportunity to to connect with other entrepreneurs? Does does it really matter for what you're doing? What, what's the vibe up there? Um, it's, it's so funny cause I, I've been away from Utah, uh, for almost 10 years. And, um, so I'm, I'm actually just getting refamiliarizing myself a little bit with it. Um, and everything I can see and everyone I've met and, and, uh, connected with has just been super energetic. It, it seems super vibrant. Um, the tech scene, entrepreneurial tech scene in Utah is super, super exciting, but there's just a, there is a certain energy uh, to what's going on in Utah that, that it has really actually surprised me a little bit. Yeah, I love it. I'm a, I'm a transplant to Utah, but uh, Utah has a, a, a special place in my heart because of the people and the vibe that it has when it comes to entrepreneurship and startups. So I'm glad that you're feeling it as well. That's, mm-hmm. uh, that's great. Now, let's, let's take a minute and you know, paint the picture of who you are, what you do for our audience. Right? I, I want to be able to, to kind of get that real quick out of the way so then we can dive into uh your background in in detail and especially brain by design yeah so i'm i'm building a company called brain by design and we really i we really specialize in the science of um human flourishing right we're we're really focused on what what's the brain science or the sort of uh, cognitive science behind you know topics like productivity, um, topics like creativity. How do how do you create um, how do you create the conditions that really make the you know create the most likelihood that that good ideas will thrive and flourish? Um, and also, you know, I feel like um, I feel like uh, a lot of people feel overwhelmed and stressed out, either whether that's work uh, at home or kind of the work life um, combo. Um, and super interested in, in why people feel stressed out and how to decrease that stress and by so doing, um, really bring out the, them living their best life. Um, so that, that's what we're up to. And, and at the core of it is really based on the, the super cool science, uh, around neuroplasticity was ba- which is basically all about how the brain can change and rewire itself. So that's the fascinating part, and that's one of the big reasons that that I think we connected, and and uh, um, we wanted you on the show. We so we met, you and I met at one of our uh, events, Founders Weekend, this this past September. Um, we exchanged information. We went out to lunch. We had a, a great conversation about mm-hmm. just this, what you're talking about, um, and and be, you know we got the the history of of who you are, what you were doing, and then uh, kind of what you're building now, what you what you have built. Um, and that's what I, I really want to get into, right? Because it's as entrepreneurs, 
we need every possible competitive advantage that we can get, right? And obviously, where do we start? We start with the brain. So you started Brain by Design. Uh, you came and spoke at one of our uh, events recently. Now let's let's dive into it, right? Let's let's go through the nitty gritty, uh, the the facts, the things that uh, that our audience can learn from you. So Brain by Design, um, how can it help me, and how can it help my audience right now? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the I think the best way to think of it is that there's been a a sort of wave of 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 science and um, research around the brain and in how it works in the last uh, you know ten twenty thirty years that is now really maturing. It, it's we we know so much about how to how the mind works, how to manage it better, um, how to change our own behavior. Um, and these things were a little more mysterious, right, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And it feels to me like now there's, there's this sort of new skill set um, that entrepreneurs and, and others are sort of slowly um, taking on which is really about how to manage their own, their own mind. And I think, um, you know, when you think about the, the kind of, you know, specifically from an entrepreneur's perspective, what are the kind of assets or valuable pieces uh, within a company, you, you know, we learn how to manage a lot of them, right? We learn how to manage our, uh, you know, uh, teams. We learn how to manage our time. But one of the things we don't necessarily learn how to manage as a skill set is our mind. And... I think in the most innovative places that is that is trickling down, we're slowly doing that. Um, but it's brand it's brand new, right? As as a sort of skill set unto itself, um, and um, it 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 I, I I believe we're kind of on the front end of what will be a, an explosion. In okay, so we know all this stuff, all this cool cool science about how the brain works. Okay, how do we actually apply this? And, and utilize this in in uh, in what we're trying to build in the world. So as we kind of get deeper into it, let's. I think this would be a, a good spot for um, our audience to know um, y- your background as far as being able to talk about this intelligently, right? I mean, are you just some guy off the street that read a, a self help book, or, or, or what? What's your background to kind of help us get there, right? And 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 when I talk about getting there, we're going to talk about that here in just a bit, but. Um, tell us about your background. What led you to this right now? Yeah, you bet. So, it's so funny. I have pretty, I have a pretty um, average uh, upbringing uh, in the sense that I grew up in the suburbs, went to public school, um, uh, grew up just out in Salt Lake, outside of Salt Lake City, and I. I, when I was in university and I started, I split my undergrad in two different places. I started it at uh, BYU and uh, started, actually, most of my young life was in music. So I was involved in a, in a lot of music growing up. And I stumbled into a psychology class it, it, as an undergrad. And I don't know, there was something, there's something magic where I just like, <laughs> I connected with it in a way that I, that, uh, that I really had never connected with anything else in my life. And I got so excited about it. It was so. It was actually the cor- a course on social psychology, and I got so excited about it because it felt so relevant, right? It was. It was about everything about persuasion and and why we do things in in group settings that's different from when we're alone. And you know, there were so many fascinating topics. Um, I got so excited. I got super, super um, fascinated by the positive psychology movement, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is sounds crazy, but I decided to, to try to transfer to uh, another school to see if I could work with, to do research with some of these scientists that I was learning about. And uh, applied to a couple places, ended up uh, getting accepted um, to Columbia in New York City, and that's where I did the second half of my undergrad. Uh, so I dove in kind of headfirst into research labs uh, it, there in New York, and Kind of, I, I studied. I sort of studied a lot of different things with those uh, professors, but but had the good fortune of working with um, people like uh, Walter Michelle, who did the famous marshmallow studies, 
um, Tori Higgins, uh, you know, a handful of others, uh, Geraldine Downey and others at Columbia, Eshkel Raffaelli. And uh, at that, from there, um, I, I, I was so, I had spent so much time doing research and so, so excited about that, I thought that the road I was going to take was become a professor, um, which is what academics were really good at, is sort of producing the same, <laughs> you know, producing miniature versions of themselves. Uh-huh. And so I, uh, we, my, I had met uh, was my, my fiance that we got married uh, when we were in New York, and then moved to Boston, and I spent a couple more years uh, in with Nani Ambadi uh, at Tufts University in Boston, doing more research in social psychology. So my my background was really being trained as a scientist, um, and in research methods, and and my pet my sort of resume was pushing me straight to do a PhD program. I was uh, kind of a, a great candidate for that. And my wife and I at that point were a little, and she had been doing research as well uh, in Boston, and we were a little frustrated with the the feeling of there being sort of a gap between what academics or scientists know and, and what gets stuck in universities and what, what happens outside of those institutions. And so... We decided to do sort of a kind of a, what felt like a little bit of crazy thing at the time, which is join Peace Corps. Uh, that took us to the Middle East, um, to Jordan, and we spent two years working really as educators there, um, and took a lot of that science and kind of the most cutting edge ideas uh, coming out of Stanford and, and other places and tried to weave them into a curriculum teaching creativity uh, and innovation and critical thinking. So that program in Jordan grew up very organically and very slowly, but by the end of our Peace Corps service, we'd build a, a whole curriculum uh, working with, with high school students. And you know, at that point, it, it sort of took on a life of its own. Um, what did you learn in the Middle East that that has helped you with brain by design? Yeah, great question. So, so we spent four years building an, an organization, a nonprofit organization, kind of in the social entrepreneurship space that was teaching innovation. Right? We we were trying to use education as a platform to try to grow the skills and skill sets of what entrepreneurs and innovators uh, need to thrive. Um, and that taught me a lot, all sorts of things, all sorts of things. One is that innovation is a learnable skill set. And, and I think there's a, I do think there's a, a longstanding notion uh, that, that a lot of people believe that, that you're kind of born as an entrepreneur, right? It's kind of this natural thing that just kind of always an entrepreneur from the time you were little. Um, and that certainly wasn't my experience. I, don't feel, I didn't feel growing up like I was necessarily drawn toward entrepreneurship. It was really something I stumbled into and by experience kind of fell in love with. And I think that same kind of a process can really happen to anybody. Uh, especially if you actually can get in touch with what people are passionate about, what they're really excited by, and then can turn that into, they, they can start working toward turning that into building some unique contribution to the world. Uh, you have a, a pretty unique and powerful formula there. You know, I like how, uh, obviously, you've spent your time at, at the university um, thinking about the brain, studying the brain, um, your time in the Middle East, right? with these 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 great people uh, other educators other uh, peace corps members and and just entrepreneurs in general out there um thinking about the brain studying the brain and so what the last 10 years or so what maybe a little bit longer you've you've been this has been your main focus right so now you bring all of that experience into this this new venture brain by design um and, and so we're excited to see what's behind it right so mm-hmm. uh, i'll let you kind of get into this but i know that that you offer uh either classes or online courses that as an entrepreneur i'm going to be able to benefit from uh being able to think differently about uh the brain how it works how i can i, I don't even know if this is a term that you would use but how i can hack it right to to be able to um work at the top of my 
productivity level. Uh, mm-hmm. If we sign up for for this for you, uh, what are we going to get, and how can that benefit us? Yeah, hacking hacking it is actually a really great metaphor because. Um, in some sense, the skill set is out. Is I, I, I hesitate to use this word, but it's really outsmarting your brain, right? There's a lot of things our brain wants us to do that end up producing poor results. Um, just a couple examples, right? Um, so when we feel overwhelmed, like we have tons to do, one of the natural things that our brain sort of pushes us to do is to multitask, to, to get into trying to do a lot of the things, things at the same time. So we've got, you know, 13 different windows we're toggling between. We're doing multiple things at the same time, all in the name of getting more done. Well, if you look pretty, if you look closely at the science around multitasking, um, what scientists have really discovered is that it's it's kind of a myth that they're there is no such thing as multitasking. What we're actually doing is task switching. Um, we are, our capacity to pay attention to more than one thing is incredibly limited at the same time. Um, so we have this kind of neural speed limit. Uh, for those who are interested in how high that is, it's about 120 bits or pieces of information per second. Uh, so it's incredibly small how, how much we can focus on at one time. And when you jump between thing after thing after thing, there's a huge cost to that. It's a task switching cost. Um, And just in terms of time, it takes anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to get back into something, into kind of a flow or a flow state into something after you're switching, uh, you know, from one thing to another. So, you know, from a a high level view, it seems like that would make sense that, uh, like you're mentioning, we're just multitask and get as much of this out of the way as possible. But sure. from what you're saying, it's actually it's it's harmful, or or it's it would take us longer because of the flow and get, kind of getting back into the groove, like you're saying. Um, I, that is interesting to me, right? Because I I'm guilty of it. I'm assuming mm-hmm. a lot of our listeners are are guilty of it. Mm. I, I, is this? I mean, is this something? Uh, a hab- I'm assuming it's a habit we can break. Uh, if we continue to just kind of uh, work at it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it is it's a, it's simply a habit, and you know the the new the uh, the alternative to multitasking is either monotasking or unitasking. Um, so our brains actually are pretty good at monotasking. Um, it's just setting up environments, right? Um, in which distraction isn't constantly interrupting that focused state. So, so a, good, a good example of, of kind of apps out there um, trying to do this, there's one called Freedom.2. Uh, you can go to Freedom.2. Um, and the app is just called Freedom. And it's a very simple technology, but basically it locks you out of websites that you pre-choose. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. And so, like, so, like, my my like go to distraction is 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 New York Times. So, so if I go to nytimes.com during my workday, I'll get this green screen that'll pop up and say, "You are free from nytimes." That is funny. <laughs> right. Uh, and it's enough to keep me from. It's just it, it. It's like it nudges me back to where I was. What I was doing, which is staying focused. Um. So 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 yeah, there's there's stuff out there happening, but uh, the um, the kind of nugget here is that learning how to monotask uh, instead of instead of multitask will not only make you more productive. Uh, scientists estimate we lose about thirty percent, twenty eight percent of our productivity because of multitasking in a given day. Um, is there a difference between you know we hear a lot about. Uh, Females and males uh, multitasking and our different abilities. Uh, does that fit into this? You know, it's a really good question. I'm not. I'm not clear on the science on that. Um, I know. I know that you know Ken Robinson talks about that that science in one of his TED talks. Um, but I'm I'm actually not familiar with the science on this. I think anecdotally. Uh, people talk about that a lot. Yeah. That, that in, with me and my wife, she I know she's definitely better at task switching than I. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> So I bring it up thinking maybe, maybe my wife is onto something. She can do it a whole lot better, but uh, sure. interesting. Okay. Sure. And, and, and so let, let's, let, like, let's break it down for you specifically. Is this something that you 
have struggled with and are continuing to struggle with? Or have you, because of the way you've been able to, um, you know, study yourself and, and the brain and, and just the other research that you've done, have you been able to, for this specific thing, the multitasking, have you been able to conquer that, uh, uh, that habit or, or that hack? Um, <laughs> so I, I'm never going to say that I've, I've conquered anything. I always feel like, uh, I'm growing. Um, I, you know, but, but I will say one thing that's helped me a lot in this particular, uh, case is, uh, is meditation. So meditation is something that always seemed really inaccessible to me. We're not weird, but just sort of abstract. And I didn't quite know how to use it as a tool. Um, and then I downloaded what now is my favorite app, Headspace. And uh, there's a lot of good meditation apps out there. Um, but Headspace is the one I use and I really like. And, um, and, I, and I do 10-minute meditations, you know, two to three times a day throughout my day. And I do find that it's made a major difference for me. Now, one of the things that, that I really liked um, uh, about you and the things that we've talked about uh, during lunch and, and other conversations that we've had is, so you talked about the multitasking, which I think that uh, I'm guilty of. Not as bad. I think, I, I think I've been able to somewhat control it when I want to. Sure. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I'm still working on that when you mentioned it, kind of clicked and said, of, of, of course, that makes sense. So now I didn't even know that it was an issue or something that I can improve upon but it is the 90-30 uh, rule or whatever, however you want to call it. Uh, but, you know, before I used to just kind of put my head down and go for as long as I could. Yeah. Uh, you kind of brought it to my attention saying that maybe that's not the way to go. So wh why don't you explain the 90-30? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so the, the first time I bumped into this was, uh, so Jeff Weiner, the LinkedIn CEO, uh, does this every day, and he calls it his most uh, important productivity tool he uses, which is he takes two hours and schedules not two, hour, two hours, block or chunks those two hours out into four 30-minute blocks, and then spreads them throughout his day to take basically big breaks throughout his day to do nothing. He schedules, he schedules nothing during that time. And when I first heard it, I was like, oh, that's fascinating. Like, here's, here's a guy who runs a super successful company, uh, obviously incredibly busy, tons of demands on his time, and yet he has two hours of, of time every day to do nothing. On the surface, that sounds like a waste of time. Right. Right? But uh, It's not. I, I, I'm assuming. Why is that? So he. So so I. So I. I was asking to say. I was thinking the same question. Why? How, what does that guy know that I don't? <laughs> That's right. And what what he, what he he d does know that uh, that uh, I didn't at the time was that there's good science behind this. And one of the one of, one of the science, the best science in this is uh, in a book called The Organized Mind by Daniel Levitin, and he talks about. The, the, the mind going basically between two modes or two um, modes of attention, okay? Uh, one is a, what he calls a stay on task mode. And a not, the other is called a, what he calls a mind wandering mode. So stay on task mode is, it's directed thinking, it's effortful, um, it feels like work. It, it, it feels after a certain period of time, you feel kind of tired. It's like mental effort. Uh, the mind wandering mode does not feel like work. It really feels like rest. You're basically just allowing your mind to do whatever it wants to kind of just run. And, and what it will do is kind of bounce from thing to thing. It'll, you know, it'll start literally wandering and free associating. Um, when you're in a task focused or, or stay on task mode, it's cognitively expensive it takes a lot of mental energy and actual physical energy. Your body, so, so your brain is only 2 to 3% of your body weight, but takes almost 20% of your body's energy. So your brain's already an energy hog. Create, needs tons of, uh, you know, uh, physical, actual nutrients to run. Uh, but the thinking brain, your, your conscious brain, the one that's, that, that is responsible for the stay on task mode, uh, is the ultimate energy hog. 
So it's an incredibly expensive activity. So what ends, ends up happening is after about 90 minutes, you really can't go much further without taking a break. Um, you, you, you know, some people can push this maybe to two hours, but, but, but really the ideal window is 50 to 90 minutes. And anytime you push beyond that, at, at the end of that, basically your brain will be craving distraction. Uh, it'll be craving a break. It's just desperate for, uh, you know, it's like running a, a big long sprint. And, and at that point you really do need to stop and, you know, drink some Gatorade and fuel up, right? Is that when your, is that when your mind is wandering or, or it's slowing down? I mean, you know, he, here I am thinking that, you know, I'm working for the next three hours and I'm not going to be distracted and I'm not going to slow down and I'm not going to take a little break. I'm just going to mm-hmm. power through the next three or four hours. Uh, so I, it sounds like it's doing more damage than than good. Um, not not taking these breaks. It is. So so what will happen is if you if you do take a break and these breaks can be anywhere from fifty to fifteen to thirty minutes, right? Um, it's the equivalent of like plugging your brain into the wall. You're just recharging. So so if the brain is like a the, if the metaphor is like a, if the brain is like a battery in in that what you were doing in the previous 90 minutes is draining that battery. What you're doing on a break is basically plugging into the wall and recharging um, your brain's capacity to do it again. Um, so so that's the, that's when your brain is in that mind wandering state, it's naturally, it's what it's doing is it's making sense of what happened in the previous 90 minutes. It's trying to organize it, to, to associate it with other things you've learned. And while it's doing that, not only is it recharging, but it's also, again, it's free associating, right? So it's connecting what you've done in the last 90 minutes with other things bouncing around in your head. So it's connecting it with the conversation you had with uh, your significant other that morning, or it's, or it's connecting it with a conversation you had with... Um, you know, one of your employees two weeks ago, and it's it's literally just free associating. And every once in a while, as it's trying to integrate and make sense of what happened in the previous ninety minutes, it stumbles upon some insight. Right? It's it's naturally trying to make those connections. In fact, it's more the right side of your brain is more active in a in a restful state, in a mind wandering mode, and it naturally. You're, so the neurons actually in the right half of your brain have have longer dendrites, <laughs> uh, which are the branches that connect neurons to each other, and so they're na- they're deep, more deeply connected and integrated into the rest of the brain. And so when you go into that kind of more restful mind wandering mode, what you're doing is sort of unlocking the key to your creative brain. You're basically giving your brain permission to do what it knows how to do, which is generate insight. And if you don't set aside that time, you don't give your brain enough space to actually make those random and kind of unusual connections. Every once in a while, one of those usual connections will turn into some you know, some aha that you, that you really do need. Uh, and if you don't take time to do that, um, then you're just not going to have as much insight into the problems you're facing. And is this, um, I, I wouldn't even know how to explain it, is this new science or is this widely uh, accepted um, and, and we're just kind of coming on board now? Um, in the scientific community, in the science community, uh, where does this thinking, uh, how does this stack up to, to other widely accepted uh, what theories or, or, or explanations? Um, the, the two attentional modes of a sort of stay on task mode, a kind of directed focus mode versus a mind wandering, um, undirected mode that is, is quite solid. Okay. Um, it's, it's, the, I so think this is the, a new age, new, you know, that, that kind of, uh, no. uh touchy feely type of stuff. I mean, this is science. I mean, this is, this is, this is out there. This is stuff that's working now. That's right. I think where it gets just a little bit grayer is sort of the exact amounts of time. Okay. Um, and and, and I, th- I would just recommend that people kind of experiment. I think the principle is sprint, break, sprint, break, right? Um, and, the, and that where um, there's some individual differences is where in the amounts of time people stay in a focused mode and then how much time they're taking for a break. 
And now let's go back to you. How are you doing with this? Um, it, <laughs> this is so, such a good question. Um, when I do it, I love myself. Yeah, I, nice. I'm, so, I'm like, oh my gosh, it works. Yes. It's so powerful, right? And then I do, I do what everybody does, which is like, oh gosh, like I'm, I, I, but I have so much to do. How can I take a break? Right. <laughs> um, so it, I've, I've, I would say in my own life that, um, it's on its way toward becoming a sort of ingrained habit in the way I structure my time, but it's not fully secure yet. <laughs> so you're working on it like, like the rest of us, right? But, but we, we, you Absolutely. see, and hopefully we see the, uh, the, the value of, of all of this. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I, that you mentioned was how your, uh, brain takes up so much energy, right? And, and, mm-hmm. and obviously very important, right? Without this energy, it's going to be difficult for us to kind of get through, uh, a day in, in and work in a meaningful way. Um, one of the things that I've heard you talk about is ways that we can reduce the amount of energy that our, our brain uses on a regular basis by just almost pre-planning some of the things that we do. Can, can you um, get into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so, so – I think the best way to think of this is the uh, the metaphor or analogy of the brain like a battery, right? Um, so one of the most fascinating things that scientists have discovered is that the uh, that, that there's a limited supply. There's a, that battery is limited throughout a day. So for those, so science scientists call this different things, um, but the but the Roy Baumeister is one of the lead psychologists on this. And he wrote a book called Willpower. Um, there's another really great book called uh, The Willpower Instinct that talks a lot about this. Um, but basically, there's a limited supply of willpower or mental energy. Uh, and as you drain that battery throughout the day, um, you'll have less battery for other things later on in the day. So this this uh, happens all the time. It's why... Um, you know, it's why before dinner we get hangry, right? It's because, you know, we're at our most depleted state, we're starving, and we're snapping at each other. Why is that? Well, we don't have as much willpower to stop from letting that emotional outburst out to, to inhibit that. So, so we, it just comes out. Um, and the same thing is true in any day. So what, there's a lot of implications for that, one of which is that your most productive hours are going to be, um, you know, morning to to sort of noon one two maybe um if you're pushing it um and afternoon hours from a productivity standpoint you're just just know that you're working on a a a more depleted battery um so there's there's a lot of different things you can do to to manage that battery better um one and i think you were alluding to this is automating routine decisions so what does that mean exactly? It's essentially the skill of deciding things once in your life and then never deciding them again and doing the same thing every day. So I'll just give an example. I eat, uh, I have like a, a morning shake I do every morning. And um, I know this probably sounds boring to some people, but for me, it's been amazing how much of a difference that makes in the routine of my day. But I, do, I eat the same thing every morning. Um, and the, but there's a thousand, so to give you a sense of how many micro decisions we make every day, a scientist estimate we make over 200 decisions based on food alone every day. Um, so the estimate is in the thousands. We make thousands and thousands of decisions every day. And decision making is one of the most willpower draining activities that we can do. So it's a, it constantly chipping away at that battery. So again, if you can pre-decide and get good at um, whether that's simple things like making a checklist for your kid's lunchbox, they get the same thing in there, and right? You, you, know, you know what you want to give them and, and why open up the fridge and go, oh, what am I going to put in it now or today or whatever? Just have, this, have the staples and just and, and throw it in or what you're – you know, it's, it's the reason that Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs wear the same thing every day. It's not because it's a fashion statement. It's actually because they're very deliberately and systematically trying to eliminate – any and all kinds of routine decisions that aren't essential to make every day because they know that by so doing, they're going to keep that battery high 
And then they can apply that mental energy and capacity to make really tough decisions like, who am I going to hire? Uh, and it really, should we go forward with this product launch or not? And um, It sounds like stuff that we can do on our own right, right away, right? I mean, uh, like you mentioned, our, our breakfast choices, what, what we wear, um, if, if we kind of set it up beforehand, we don't have to spend that energy that day or a string of days, you know, put together, whatever. And that is going to help us save more energy, be, be more productive, uh, make better decisions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, scientists call it decision fatigue. Uh -huh. And, and um, you don't think of the process of making decisions as being a, as exhausting you or, or depleting your mental battery. Right. You, you, we don't, we don't necessarily, it doesn't, it's not necessarily intuitively obvious that the more decisions I make, the, the less energy I'm going to have to resist uh, a brownie tonight, quite yeah. literally, right? It, before I go to bed, but they're directly related. And that's what's so fascinating about the brain. It's the same thing that, that and, and it, like when you're going shopping, right? Um, why shopping can feel so exhausting sometimes. All shopping is is a series of micro decisions. All you're doing is saying buy, don't buy. You yes. should I buy it? No, 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 no. And it's exhausting, and it feels weird. It's like we're just shopping. Like, what's the big deal? Shouldn't we be enjoying this? <laughs> uh, well, it's actually pretty cognitively taxing on your brain, and the same is true with every kind of decision we're making in our life. So, anything you can do to eliminate or reduce the number of decisions in a given day, the more willpower or brain energy you have to apply to things you really care about, like. Being present with your kids, right, and really being with them when you are with them, or um, again making those hard decisions, or generating uh, new ideas for for something you're working off working on in your business. When we first met, I, I pegged you as as more of the uh, academic type than uh, entrepreneur running your own business uh, uh, type of uh, of individual. You're, you're both, right? With Brain by Design, it's new. It's a new business. You obviously want to grow it. You want to, to, to do good in the world. Um, where are you as far as uh, being the more scientific side of you, the, the more academic side of you, and, and the entrepreneurial um, business person? Are you comfortable in both fields, uh, or do you lean uh, more towards one than the other? Yeah, it's a great question. Um. I would say that I love both equally. Okay. Um, and I guess that love has grown up over time, especially on the entrepreneurship side. My first love was the science. Um, but the entrepreneurial side grew up um, really out of our experience in building uh, an organization that went from just my co founder and I to 17 people and, and, and was, was, you know, it was. Uh, you know, at the time for what we were doing, uh, felt like it was a pulsing, you know, thing that we were building. And um, that process of, of building uh, something in the world, something, a vision that you have, a sort of, um, uh, you know, putting yourself out there and trying to make a difference in the world in, in any form, doing, you know, getting in tune with your own unique creative contribution in the world and really going out and trying to build that, uh, I think is um, what makes me so passionate about entrepreneurship. And, and really where the intersection of those two things feels like where my intrinsic interests and motivations are. Because it feels to me like Everybody has a unique voice, right? Everybody has a unique uh, opportunity to really put themselves out there and, and do something amazing in the world. And I'm really fascinated by the psychology of why, 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 what holds us back, right? When we aren't out there putting forward, forward our best, uh, most creative, unique, um, and, and passionate selves in, in the service of a bigger cause, uh, what 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 are the what are the factors that that, that hold us hold us back from doing that? Um, because I think everybody on some level uh, wants to make a difference, right? Want, wants to stand up and 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 contribute. So, with you contributing with with Brain by Design, then what is this going to look like in three years? Right, it's, it's fairly new. Obviously, I'm assuming you have big plans. I know you have big plans. Um, yeah. When we have you back on the on the show in three years, 
what are we going to be talking about and what is this going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> so I, I believe that there's a growing movement of, uh, and it's still, it's taking different, taking different names and different forms, but it, uh, the one that's sort of stick sticking with me is science help that, that all of us want to become better and develop and grow. And traditionally the, the, there, there's been a, there's been sort of a vacuum of sort of who's who's leading, you know, the rest of us in that process, and it's really been the self help industry, right? The personal development industry, and the the range. Um, and I, I I walk really carefully here because I actually have like a lot of love in my heart for this entire industry. Uh, I think I think a lot of things, a lot of stuff that the, that is taught there and that's going on there is incredibly positive and incredibly powerful for people. Um, that said, I do think there is incredible value for a brand new way to think about that, which is science help. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's looking at, it's looking at growth, human growth and development and flourishing through the lens of science and, and really saying, okay, when you do really, really good research, really tightly controlled clinical, you know, studies, what what comes out the other end? You know, do, is it is it true that, um, you know, a, a simple example of this is is in the self help uh, space. One of the most common things people do, and 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 people get a hard time for this, right? This is Stuart Smalley saying, "I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. Yeah. God, there are people like me." It's called they're called declarations, uh -huh. right? Um, and, and we, the, the self-help industry gets a sort of a lot of flack for, uh, you know, it's, people think, oh, I think it's cheesy yeah. or it's so much or whatever it is. And the science just asks the question, well, does it work? <laughs> right? Um, does it work? And, uh, Andrew, I just read this interesting piece in Daniel, one of Daniel Pink's book called To Sell as Human about the research around, um, De about declarations and, and whether that works and what, what the findings actually are is that posing a question which is like saying okay so say you're going to give a, a talk you know public speaking or you know you're you're about to do some hard thing is it better to say I am an amazing public speaker three times before you go on stage or uh, is it better you know a few days prior to think can I do this to actually ask a question? Am, is this, can I, can I, can I do this? Uh, or, or can I, or, you know, in another scenario, right? Uh, if, if, uh, it's, it's about, uh, fundraising or whatever the, whatever the challenge is, you know, can I raise a hundred thousand dollars? What scientists actually find is that posing a question ends up being more powerful than making a statement. So if you're, if you're, if you're, waking up every morning and you're listening to pr recordings of yourself saying like, I'm going to raise a, you know, a million dollars by X date again and again and again, that, that will help putting out that concrete goal and that, um, sort of positive energy. It, it will help. It will get you uh, part of the way there, but actually turning it around and framing it as a question, can I do this? It activates a part of your brain that will basically start solving the problem and answering the question, it will look and start looking for evidence and say things like, well, yeah, uh, I mean, I successfully raised money, you know, three years ago. And what did I do then? Right? Like what went well in there? And, and your brain is doing this all automatically, right? Once you activate, activate your brain with the question, it's going to start answering that question. And it's going to start building an arsenal of evidence that, yeah, no, no, I can do this. And not only that, but it's also going to put it in a learning state. So you're going to start, you're going to start thinking to yourself, so what went well in that last time that I was mm -hmm. fundraising? Um, X, Y, and Z. And what didn't go well, right? What can I improve on the next time? Uh, anytime you're doing like a, if you're in this sort of, you know, I'm, I can do it. Uh, this is going to be amazing. You're not actually in a learning mode. And so your brain is not um, looking for how it can grow and improve. Uh, so anyway, all that's to say is that the science, science help as a, as the future 
of personal growth and development, I think, is where is where we're headed. And what does that mean for brain by design? Well, I think we're one of many people uh, and many groups and many companies who are pushing the front edge of this uh, wave of how do we take the very best science, how do we take um, what we really know about the brain and behavior and how it all works and fits together, and how do we use it? How do we create tools with it? How do we integrate it into our lives and, in, and into our workplaces? Um, so how, how are you going to do it? Are, are, I know you're a speaker and a coach. Are, are you going to be doing more of that stuff, more of the consulting side of it, or are you going to try to build an agency around Brain by Design uh, to kind of get the message out there, the, the programs, the, the, uh, the teachings? Uh, what is that piece going to look like? So I'll be offering, uh, so I'm starting to offer like a foundational course. It's called Brain and Mind. Um, the next one coming up is January 18th. Um, it's a 12-week course, and basically it will go through all of the foundational stuff around the intersection of habits and willpower, around motivation and about the skill of self-motivation, how do you get yourself to do hard things, how to align with your intrinsic motivation, around the skill of mindfulness, uh, and really how to, 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 to build that into um, what you're doing. Um, also, on how to unlock these sort of more tricky things like creativity, how to really increase the likelihood that you're going to be generating good ideas with yourself and with your team. So, so that's concretely what's coming up, and I'll be offering that every uh, three months, uh, so every quarter. Um, it'll be an online, it'll be a live webinar-based uh, course. It'll be live, but it'll be online. Um, and then outside of that, I'm doing, I do, yes, I do, um, uh, speaking and, uh, and, and sort of private coaching and, and team, team level coaching. So that's, that's brain by design where I think it'll be in three years. I think will um, it feels to me like, um, it feels to me like the, that, that it's a collaborative effort. I'm hoping that I'm not the. I'm not hoping that that I that there are hundreds of others trying to build this same momentum of taking the best we know in science and really applying it to human behavior, productivity, reducing stress, uh, increasing our creativity and our potential. Um, and ultimately, and and I don't know how much we've even talked about this ever, but ultimately, uh, I think there's. Um, a future for uh, technology, right? There's a technology piece to this. Um, you, you see companies like um, Happify and uh, Lumosity, uh, Joyable, um, a handful of others uh, who are trying to do this, uh, Better Works, um, um, who, who, are try who are doing this on the, uh, uh, you know, whether it's an app based technology or whatever, um, taking Happify takes the best of positive psychology. Uh, and and really uh, tries to integrate that into a platform to increase people's well-being and happiness. And Lumosity does it with sort of, you know, increasing your ability to uh, memorize and, and think clearly and be more cognitively flexible and those types of things. So I think we're going to see more of that. And ultimately, I, I'm, I'm looking at building my own uh, sort of app uh, or, or technology that would be something nice. like a personal trainer for your habits. Nice. Um, so that's, that's where it's going sort of in parallel with, with what I'm building with, uh, so that, on the coaching that's, side. Ex that's exciting. I mean, that, that's something that's obviously as entrepreneurs, right? We're, we're so busy focusing on our services or the products that, that we're trying to launch or, or the work that we're doing that sometimes we forget that, um, we need to take care of ourselves, right? Physically, emotionally, uh, spiritually, all those things, uh, mentally that I, I think that people like you and the work that you're doing and the, the, the apps that you're talking about and just the, the way of thinking can, can definitely help all of us uh, just kind of get to the next level uh, personally uh, and, and as a company. Now, mm -hmm. with, with that being said, you, you've kind of given us, you've given us a lot of different um, uh, nuggets of information, great stuff that we can kind of take into our own lives and, and uh, uh, grow from there. Uh, overall, though, with all the experiences you've had with um, all the entrepreneurs that, that you've talked to, all the presentations that you've given, um, for our audience today, right now, uh, what can we walk away with um, from you? What, what last piece of advice do you have for them? I think we all live way below our potential. Um, and 
what I would say is that you have built into your brain the capacity for massive, amazing uh, contribution, and and uh, you have that your brain is really rewired or, or wired for um, for transformation. Right? Uh, we we often have this idea that people don't really change. Um, or at least fundamentally, right? These sort of core parts of ourselves are just these sort of static parts of my personality or whatever. And the science around neuroplasticity has really upended all of that. That if you can understand and learn how to apply enough effort in the right way, you can change all sorts of aspects of what you're doing and, and, and how you're doing it. You know, the every everything from uh, what we've been talking about in terms of productivity to, to even working on things that maybe you're not as um, thrilled to, to share. Maybe, maybe right, that we all have things I think about ourselves that, that uh, we wish we could be better at, right? Maybe we're a little impatient or we're, um, we're, uh, uh, we don't have um, the kind of uh, discipline or, or sort of um, or or other things that that uh, that we would like to improve. And the, the the hopeful message of neuroplasticity in this kind of this line of research is that everyone can change. You know th- this 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 way of thinking, right? It, it's opened doors and and different ways of thinking for for me personally. Um, and obviously everything that I like and that I think is beneficial, I like to bring, uh, in, in front of our group, in front of our, uh, different mastermind groups, in front of our audience here on the podcast, the events that we have. And, and obviously I'm all in, I, I want to know more. I want to learn more, right? It's, it's already helped me in, in what, in the four or five months that, that we've known each other, the, the things that you've brought up, the things that we've talked on a personal level and, uh, through the events, uh, and the, the, the different, uh, programs that you present has already helped me. So I, I, I want our audience to at least um, check it out a little bit more, uh, maybe even uh, contact you and, and kind of talk to you one-on-one to see if this fits and if it's something that they should be uh, working on uh, with you themselves. So w- with that being said, um, for our audience, where can we find you online if we want to connect with you, email, uh, social media, website, any of that stuff? Feel free to share that with us right now. Um, it's brainbydesign.com. Um, you can go there, check out what we're up to. Uh, you can also f- there find more information on this 12-week course. Um, I think I might have mentioned this at the beginning, but the next one is starting January 18th. Um, it's uh, I'm this th- this course that I offer will is like a foundation, right? W- once you go through this you will have a foundation for how you can change almost any behavior or pattern of behavior in your life. And I'm, it's the kind of thing that I've, I've struggled with how to price, price it. I think most people offer these things for anywhere from 600 to a thousand bucks. Um, I, I'm offering it for 297 bucks. Um, and, uh, you know, you've been so great to me ever. And I, I really love what you guys are up to. And, um, for those anybody who's interested in signing up for the January 18th course, uh, you can sign up. Uh, I have a discount code if that if that makes a difference. Uh, so for the listeners of the podcast, um, for anybody who's interested, it's Outlier on Air, uh, 100 off. So that'll that'll cut 100 bucks off the off the cost. Perfect. Well, that's very generous, and we we really appreciate it. So Outliers, take advantage of this. Uh, first of all, go to our website outliermagazine.co. That's outliermagazine.co. Subscribe to our podcast, rate, review it, uh, share with your friends. But there you're going to find um, th- links to uh, James's website, um, the, his social media accounts, this discount code. Take advantage of it. Uh, if if you want to find out more information, like we mentioned, uh, reach out to him. He can uh, uh, one-on-one conversation to, to see if, if this is a good fit. Uh, James, hey, we really appreciate you taking the time to to talk to us, uh, giving us your, your words of wisdom, the different things that, that you're working on, kind of getting to know you a little bit better. Uh, no doubt that this has been beneficial, uh, not just for me personally, but uh, for our audience. We wish you much success, and we're going to keep up. Uh, we're going to keep checking in on you to see where this uh, where this all leads. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being on the show. Uh, thank you, Ever. Really appreciate it.
So outliers, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Just hop